Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I heard a story <laughs> about two young men. They decided to go to Vegas. They lived kind of far away. The airfare was a lot, so they took a bus. They got there, and when they did, they immediately started gambling. Now, I'm not condoning gambling, and I'm not condemning it either. I'm just going to say that I don't gamble. You shouldn't either. Anyway, they started gambling. <laughs> a few hours went by. They didn't even bother getting a hotel room, nothing. They just went straight for the gambling. And sure enough, one of the young men ran out of money. The other one had about half his money left. So he said, you know what? I'm going to stop because we still need a hotel room bus fare back home, all that other stuff. So he was smart, and we'll call him the smart young man for now. The other one wanted to continue, so he approached the smart young man, and he said, give me your money. Come on, you got to stay in it to win it. You're a chicken. Standard deviation. You just got to keep going. He's like, no. <laughs> we need a place to stay. We need some food. We haven't eaten yet. We got to get home. Well, he keeps pressuring him and pressuring him, and finally he relents. He says, fine, take the money. Well, sure enough, he blows that money too. Then has the nerve to turn to the smarter young man and say, what are we going to do now? Like it's his fault. I told you so. So the smarter young man says, well, let's go to the bus station. We'll go there. At least we get some shelter. We could sleep on the benches there. We'll make a couple signs. Need food and money. So they do just that. They leave out some baseball hats so that when they fall asleep, maybe some generous people will leave some money. Well, they fell asleep, woke up in the morning, really hungry now. Now they're missing two meals. You know how young men are. They need to eat all the time. They check the hats, and there's not much in there. Some coins and stuff, a few nasty notes. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, dude. So nothing that they can really use to get back home. Along comes an old man, and he sees... The first man, the one who lost his money first. Let's call him the angry young man now. And he says, you know, I don't have much cash on me, but I do have this dollar. <laughs> the angry young man responds angrily. What am I going to do with a dollar here in Vegas? You're crazy. Take your dollar and get out of here. Okay? Goes to the smarter young man says, you want the dollar? Your friend won't take it. Yeah, thank you very much. Every little bit. It adds up. Okay. Goes away. The angry young man makes fun of him. What are you going to do with that dollar, right? So time goes by. They see the old man coming back. But he has a bag, paper bag. And they can smell it before he gets there. It's food. He walks up to the smarter young man and hands it to him. Well, he opens it up. Wow, it's a whole bunch of hamburgers and stuff. Good food. And he just tears into it, thank you very much. The angry young man, where's mine? Puts his hand there, grabs some food. So they're eating. And the old man, he's just smiling, watching them eat the food and enjoy it. They're real hungry. Waits a few minutes. Takes out a bus pass out of his pocket. He gives it to the smart young man. One bus pass. The angry young man realizes what's going on. He was real hungry, hangry. He says, hey, wait a minute. I thought you said you had no money. The older man said, replied, said, oh, no, no, that's not what I said. I said I didn't have a lot of cash on me. I bought the bus ticket and the food with a credit card. Well, where's mine? He responds, you see, those who are faithful with little are usually faithful with much. Well, it's true that a gift giver will continue to give gifts to those who are appreciative, those who show gratitude. It is also true that a gift giver will stop giving gifts to those who reject them. Today, we find ourselves in the rest of the story. You can catch up 
online, but it'll take you a while. We've been in this series for about a year. We're going to be in this series for a while longer. Why? Because we're honoring God's Word. We're looking at the whole Bible. Last week, we saw the account where Elijah was taken up. We looked at forerunners. It's all pointing, as we're learning, to Jesus. This is all about Jesus. So a forerunner to John the Baptist. John the Baptist, a forerunner or herald for Jesus to Jesus. It's where it's all going. We saw Elisha, his successor. Now we're going to take a look at some of Elisha's first miracles. So he asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and indeed, he gets a double portion. He does a lot of miracles. 2 Kings 2.19, we'll start at the middle of that chapter. One day, the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem, my lord, they told him. This town is located in pleasant surroundings, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Elisha said, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with water and threw the salt into it. And he said, this is what the Lord says. I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death or infertility. And the water has remained pure ever since, just as Elisha said. So we see salt is usually symbolic in the Bible of permanence. We see it a bunch of different times. If you're paying attention to the law of Moses, the offerings are salted, permanence. The permanence of the covenant. We see it other places too. Jesus brings it up. It can be confusing. But the main thing here is that the salt isn't magical salt or anything like that. It's just symbolic. God is the one who purified the water. So if you remember, Elijah was a hairy man. Remember that description? And he had what? A leather belt. Well, here we see that Elisha is not. It's kind of one of the stranger stories in the Bible. It says that Elisha leaves Jericho, he goes to Bethel, and some young boys or boys or young men, young people, are making fun of him. They start saying, go away, baldy, <laughs> go away, baldy, and so he stares at them and curses them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears come out of the woods and maul 42 of them. That's it. <laughs> That's all it says. Kind of funny. Always makes me laugh. Not, you know, I don't feel sorry for the boys. Some people try to downplay this a little bit, and they say, it says mauled, not killed. Don't worry about the boys. Yeah, I think if you got mauled by a bear, you might at least want to die. It's just saying, right? So anyway, it's a weird thing. I'm just going to admit that. I'm not going to try to excuse it. It's there for a reason. Anyway, if we turn the page, another kind of confusing thing, if you've been paying attention to names, it gets really difficult here. I get it. Some people quit around here trying to figure it out. We see King Jehoshaphat of Judah. He's back in the story. And that may be kind of weird to you because if you remember, he died. It summarized his reign. It's like a lot of stories that we read today or TV shows where they go in and out of time. It's hard to completely parallel these things. So he's going to come back in and we'll see some other interactions. Turn the page, 2 Kings 3.1. Ahab's son, Joram, began to rule over Israel in the 18th year of King Jehoshaphat's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 12 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, but not to the same extent as his father and mother. He at least tore down the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had set up. Nevertheless, he continued in the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, so that's the first king of Samaria with the two golden calves, had committed and led the people to, of Israel to commit. King Maisha of Moab was a sheep breeder. He used to pay the king of Israel an annual tribute of 100,000 lambs, that's a lot, and the wool of 100,000 rams. But after Ahab's death, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Joram promptly mustered the army of Israel and marched from Samaria. On the way, he sent a message to King Jehoshaphat of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you join me in battle against him? And Jehoshaphat replied, why, of course, you and I are as one. My troops are your troops and my horses are your horses. Then Jehoshaphat asked, what route will we take? We will attack from the wilderness of Edom, Joram replied. So there are a few things at play here. This might sound familiar to you. 
Right? So some people are going, yes. Yeah. So King Ahab, remember Ahab and Jezebel, the wicked people. King Ahaziah was their son. He died. He had no son. So now Joram, his brother, takes over. It may say Jehoram. There's actually two in the north and the south. Makes it kind of confusing. But this should sound like exactly <laughs> the conversation between Jehoshaphat and Ahab when he made that foolish alliance that got him killed. We are as one. My troops are your troops. My horses are your horses. So now this is the third alliance he's made with that family. He made it with Ahaziah with the ships that got destroyed. So what happens is they get Edom to join them also. So they've all been enemies at one point. They go seven days into the wilderness and they're like, it's pretty abrupt in the text, uh-oh, we have no water. Poor planning, I guess. Well, there's a drought and a famine in the land. So this is what happens. Jehoshaphat says another thing. Isn't there a prophet among us? That sounds familiar, too, if you've been paying attention. They say, or an officer in their army says, Elisha's here. Good, let's go see him. So they go to Elisha, and Elisha responds at first, not good. He's like, the king of Israel's there. He knows he's evil. Why did you even bother coming to me, basically, is what he said. If it weren't for Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, they tend to be a little less wicked down there in the south. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't even talk to you. What he says next is kind of interesting. Get me a harp. <laughs> so the harp is placed, like the salt. It's not a magical harp or anything like that. Maybe he's distracted. So the music is going on, and he prophesies that there are going to be pools of water everywhere. And not just this, because this is just a small thing for the Lord. Basically tells them that they're going to destroy Moab, stop up their springs, ruin their land with rocks, and cut down their trees. So the next morning, about the time of the morning sacrifice, there's water everywhere. Well, the enemy, Moab, sees it. But the sun is in just the right position, so it's making it look red like blood. So they come to a pretty logical conclusion because these three armies, they've been enemies before, they killed each other, right? Let's go loot them. So they go out perhaps a little unprepared and get defeated by Israel and their, their armies. So very interesting. <laughs> well, we'll get to a point. What, what the king of Moab does is interesting, and I want to explain this to you guys because a lot of people get... The God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, and they try to separate them out. This is a thing that's been going on. I'm just pausing myself because I'm trying not to say names of <laughs> some of the very famous people doing this. The king of Moab gets frustrated. He goes out with 700 troops, tries to break through Edom's line. He's not successful. They get defeated. And he does something interesting. He sacrifices not just one of his sons, but his oldest son, the one who was to be king. And everyone's disgusted with Israel. And it just says that they go away. Here's the point I want to pause on. Just had to breathe for a little self-control there. <laughs> there are some teachers, they're trying to gather more people into the church. And one of the ways that they're doing that is they're trying to be more and more and more culturally sensitive, right? So God does not change, but we do, right? So we got to give people what they want. And it's actually been suggested and done in some very popular churches where they're simply just throwing out the Old Testament. It's ridiculous. So they're taking this huge chunk, more than half, of God's Word and throwing it away. They're no longer teaching on it anymore. And so excuse me if I find that very offensive because it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. It's very important. So people see God there's this really mean God in the Old Testament. He's destroying all these people. Oh, that looks like genocide. I want to make a little note here for you. Did you hear what I said? Read it. He killed his son. They're killing children. The Israelites did it. And as we continue reading, they'll do it more. They actually engage in cannibalism, eating their own children. These are not nice people. They're evil. And so it is God's right to enact judgment on them. He reserves that right. He gave them free will, and they chose to do all this evil stuff. We need to learn that lesson here. It's important. And if you read your New Testament, go all the way to the end. You'll see that Jesus doesn't seem so nice either when he comes back. 
just saying. So just a note there for you guys, right? We can't throw away the Old Testament. It's not a different God. That will bring us into some really horrible, horrible theology. It is the same triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This all points to Jesus. Got it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Had to do that. Yes, we'll go five minutes over. Everyone here will probably live. We have a defibrillator or whatever you call it out there in case you got another problem. That's not. <laughs> All right. So if we turn the page, I'm done with that section now. If we turn the page, <laughs> 2 Kings 4.1. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, my husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. So, Elijah says, what do you have in the house? And she said, just a little flask of olive oil. Okay, here's what you do. Go to your friends and borrow a bunch of jars or jugs, so bigger than the flask. Get as many as you can, bring them in your house, close the door behind you, bring your sons in there, and just keep filling them up with this little flask. So she does. And the oil just keeps coming out and coming out and fills up all the jars. She asks her son, give me another one. We're out. So she goes and tells, it says, the man of God, it's Elisha, what happened. He said, good. Now go and sell the olive oil. It's a commodity. She can sell it for a lot of money, pay off all your debts, and then you can live on what's left over. It was a lot. It's very similar to what Elijah did. We're going to start seeing food, multiplication, miracles here. 2 Kings 4.8, one day Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and refurbish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. So they went to Ikea, and then... Oh, no, then <laughs> Just making sure you're paying attention. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak with her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. So call the woman back again. Elisha says, this time next year, you'll be holding a son in your arms. No, my lord, don't deceive me or get my hopes up. Hang on to that. Put it in your back pocket. But sure enough, the woman becomes pregnant the following year, she has a child. So now this gets a little strange because it says one day later, <laughs> the boy is working out in the field with the father, or he's with his father in the field. So I'm thinking it's years later, but maybe he's a boy hanging out with his father in the field. Get some indications. He might be still young. Thing is, he says, my head hurts, my head hurts. So he sent back to the house Mother has him in his, her arms, so he's got to be somewhat smallish. He dies. What she does is interesting. She brings him upstairs so she can carry the boy into this upper room, puts him on Elisha's bed, then calls for her husband, says, hey, bring a servant, a donkey here with me. We've got to hurry up. Now, the husband's thinking, wait a minute, why do we need to go to the man of God? She asks him, we've got to go to the man of God, or I have to anyway. It's not a Sabbath or anything like that. She says, it'll be fine. Everything's going to be fine. So she goes to see Elisha, who's on Mount Carmel now, with Gehazi, his servant or assistant. They see her coming. Sends Gehazi, go see what's going on. When Gehazi approaches her, is everything okay? Everything's fine, she says. But her son's just died. That's weird. She gets up to Elisha, and when she sees him, she falls at his feet. Gehazi's like, get off of him, kind of thing. He says, no, 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 she's got something to say. I don't know what it is yet. And she says something interesting. Did I ask you for a son? And didn't I say, don't deceive me or get my hopes up? So first, he sends Gehazi 
He says, don't talk to anybody on the way. You got to get there. Take the staff. Put it on the child's face. Bring him to life, he thinks. So Gehazi goes, and the woman does something similar to what Elisha did with Elijah. I'm not going to go. I'm not going back unless you come with me. Interesting. Well, so they're on their way behind Gehazi. Gehazi tries the staff. It doesn't work. He meets them, whatever, halfway. Didn't work. So Elisha gets there. He goes up to the upper room. He closes the door behind him, and he does something like Elijah did. He lays out over the boy. He starts to get warm. Prays. Paces back and forth once. Lays out on him again. Boy comes to life. Sneezes seven times, it says. The woman is extremely grateful. Takes him down the stairs in her arms. So it's very similar to what Elijah did. So you can go back and watch previous messages where it kind of explain that type of of healing. Remember, there's a famine in the land, so we have a couple more food miracles. There's a bunch of the prophets around. One of the servants goes out to get some herbs for a stew, but he picks up a bunch of gourds. It's a pocket full of gourds. He doesn't know that they're poisonous. Chops them up, puts them in the stew, but when they begin eating them, they realize it's poisonous. Elijah says, no problem. Get me some flour. Take some flour and like the salt. It's not magical flour. They're all okay. They live. Nobody dies from the poison stew. If we keep reading, 2 Kings 4, 42. One day, a man from Balshalisha <laughs> brought the man of God a sack of fresh grain and 20 loaves of barley bread made from the first grain of the harvest. Elisha said, give it to the people so they can eat. What? His servant exclaimed. Feed a hundred people with only this? But Elisha repeated, Give it to the people so they can eat. For this is what the Lord says, everyone will eat, and there will even be some left over. And when he gave it to the people, there was plenty for all and some left over, just as the Lord had promised. So we're seeing food miracles here. And when we looked at Elijah, I told you how that related to the feeding of the 5,000. Everybody knows that one, the feeding of the 5,000. But what a lot of people don't realize that is that in the Gospels, there's a second mass feeding miracle, the feeding of the 4,000. So we're going to pick up there, but we're going to go to Mark because something interesting happens on today's theme. And I've told you in the past, you've got to keep reading. It's all put together in a certain way for a certain reason. So I'm going to summarize a few accounts for you. It's not my objective to go through every detail here like it was with the Old Testament accounts because I want you to see the bigger picture here, what's going on. So Mark 7, Jesus heals a blind man, a fatha, a deaf mute, sorry, not a blind man, deaf mute. The fatha, he can see. So he gathers a lot of crowds now. They're following him. And he says, wait a minute. I feel sorry for these people. They've been with me for three days now. They don't have anything to eat. They're a long way from home. They're going to pass out or faint on the way back. The disciples say, where will we get food from them? <laughs> they don't remember the 5,000 fed. So Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? Seven. Great. Matthew, a few fish too. So sit down, <laughs> gathers them up in groups, gives thanks for the bread, thanks for the fish. Thank you, God, blesses it. And then all of a sudden, the disciples are able to hand out bread to 4,000 people. Some say 4,000 men, so there's like three times as many people there, women and children, than that. Anyway, an awful lot of people. Then it says they get in the boat to go to Dal Manutha or Magdala. It says in Matthew, different place. They're similar regions. So anyway, Dal Manutha, they get in the boat. The Pharisees find out Jesus is coming. So they're going to demand a sign. I've told you about this in the past. Jesus is like, Ugh, why do you keep asking me for all these miracles? I am the bread of life. He gets frustrated. This generation will not see a sign. Gets back in a boat, goes to the other side of the lake. The disciples start freaking out. Wait, we only have one loaf of bread with us. What are we going to do? Jesus says, 
beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, like the yeast of the Pharisees. He's going to make a little connection. Then they're arguing about why they don't have any bread. It's like, why are you arguing about the fact that you don't have bread? Do you have eyes and you can't see, ears and you can't hear? Quoting Jeremiah. When I fed the 5,000 with the five loaves, two fish, two, how many leftover baskets were there? Twelve, they said. So this is a math quiz he's giving them. They're passing so far. When I fed the 4,000 with the seven loaves, how many baskets of leftovers did we have? Seven, they said. And you still don't believe? You can't figure it out? So we're going to start seeing a theme of belief here. So there's an interesting thing going on. You see this parabolic kind of healing. This is where the blind man appears. So they're in Bethsaida, and there's a man who's blind. So he takes him out of the town. I can explain that at Bible study. It's kind of a long explanation. He takes him out of town. He doesn't want anyone to know he's doing it. And it says he spits in his eyes, right? Rubs the spit in the man's eyes. He says, can you see now? Yeah, but not clearly. I see people walking around like trees. Puts his hands on his eyes again, lays hands on him, it says, and then he can see. In today's account of 2 Kings, the woman at Shunem didn't believe at first. Don't deceive me. Don't get my hopes up. But then when she receives the gift of the son, she believes. She believes in Elisha. She now has faith. Then what happens? Elisha raises the boy from the dead. She confidently goes with belief. Likewise, in this account now, the disciples didn't believe in the boat, even after all these miracles, right? Then, he's in Caesarea Philippi, and he asks his disciples, who do the people say I am? Well, then they answer, maybe John the Baptist, maybe Elijah, maybe one of the prophets, Matthew says, maybe Jeremiah. Yeah, but who do you say I am? Peter answers, the Messiah. So the blind man's healing is sandwiched in there for a reason. At first, not so much. Now they believe. If we keep reading, kind of. <laughs> so now what happens is Jesus starts telling them that he's going to suffer. He's going to be rejected by the priest, the religious leadership there. He's going to be killed, but he'll raise again on the third day. Peter says, no. He takes him aside, tries to correct him. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Then he gathers the crowd. You're not, you're not focusing on God's will, but human will. You're thinking like a man, not like God. Gathers the crowd around, and he says this. You don't hear this an awful lot, but I'd say it a lot because it's important, and Jesus said it a lot. Anyone who wants to be my follower must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. If you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and the sake of the gospel, you'll save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his life? He means eternal life, so some versions say soul. If we turn the page, we get to the transfiguration where Moses and Elijah appear. We talked about that last week, so you can go back and look. But if we keep reading, we see another account of someone's child being healed. Now, I know there are other places where children are raised from the dead, Luke 7, Mark 5. But follow this theme with me. It's a child being healed. So they come down from the mountain, and there's an argument. Jesus wants to know why, like he doesn't know, right? But he plays with us a little bit, lets us kind of participate a little bit. What are you arguing about, he says. Well, someone comes from the crowd and says, well, I brought my son here to be healed but your disciples couldn't heal him. So he has this problem where he has a demon in him, so he can't speak. He seizes up, and he gives a longer explanation later. Your disciples couldn't do it. He says, oh, you unbelieving generation. How long will I be with you? How long will I put up with you? 
clearly frustrated. Remember how Gehazi couldn't heal the boy. You ever wonder why? Some of you know about Gehazi. We'll get to him later. Don't spoil it, Lonnie. <laughs> we'll get to him next week. But here if we keep reading Mark, we see an interesting exchange. So the father describes the condition again when the evil spirit recognizes Jesus. It sends him into this convulsion again. And the father, well, he says, how long has this been happening? Jesus asks another question he knows the answer to. Since he was a boy, the father says. It seizes him up, throws him into water and fire and tries to kill him. Help me if you can. If I can, Jesus says. Anything's possible for someone who believes. I do believe, the man says, but help me in my unbelief. Huh. Well, Jesus heals the boy, long story. Sure, they think he's dead. He's not dead. Jesus you know, he stops the convulsion, helps him up, and he's alive now. So the disciples ask him later, why couldn't we heal him? takes two different accounts. Well, I like having a lot of accounts to get the complete answer. Mark, this kind can only come out with prayer, meaning the evil spirit. You can only cast out an evil spirit like that with prayer. Some versions say fasting. We don't like that word. Matthew, more blunt, because you don't have enough faith. So, Here's the thing, as an application. What does the life of a believer look like? What does the life of someone who has faith look like? Well, Jesus says, prayer, right? You've got to pray a lot. But prayer is something that we don't always see. So again, what does the life of a believer look like? We can tell someone is a believer by how they respond to God's gift. It's a response. The life of a believer looks like someone doing God's will. What we do says more about what we believe than anything we could ever say. We talk a lot about the verse of the day here. As helpful as it is, and I'm just very glad that people are attempting to read Scripture, and it's great that they read the one line and then shared it with everyone without knowing the context at all, <laughs> it's not enough. You have to keep reading in order to get the context and understand what's being said. So we looked at John 3 last week, and I showed you what happens afterwards. A lot of people were like, huh? It says that there, yeah. It's not just 316. But let's take a look at what's in between those two places, and I want to show you something. John 316, for God so loved the world, for this is how God loved the world, good translation, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who hate, do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see what the, that they are doing what God wants. Two quick side notes. So here's the thing. When you don't read the whole book of John, or you don't read the whole New Testament, you kind of miss a point. And so people will pick up on this, because they just like those, they, wow, I got one verse, two verses, past John 3.16, yay! Now I won't ever be judged. Really? Now I don't have to do anything. But did you see what it said? 
those who continue to sin, <laughs> they haven't come into the light. They're not believers. Read Hebrews 10. Someone who continually and intentionally keeps sinning over and over and over again. There's no longer a sacrifice for that person. Ooh, but keep reading. And if you read the Gospel of John, something becomes very apparent, and it can seem confusing. So I want to help a lot of you today, because even longtime believers get this wrong. So I want to help you understand this. Because it seems like Jesus is contradicting himself. At some times, he will say, I didn't come to judge the world. Then other times, he'll say, I'm going to judge the world. And you'll go, huh? First John's really confusing. If we say we don't have sin, we're liars. I'm writing this to you so that you do not sin. Anyone who hates his brother doesn't love God. What's going on here? As far as the Gospel of John, this is what Jesus is saying. I didn't come into the world now, at that time, 2,000 years ago, God in flesh, to judge it. I came to save it by sacrificing myself, dying for all of you. That's why I'm here now. But when I come back the next time, those who haven't received that gift with gratitude, oh, I'm going to judge them. That's what he's saying. And if you read Romans 14, 1 Peter, for example, judgment begins with us. That's what it says. Christians first. Pay attention. Right? So, got to read the whole thing. It says, but those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. You see, it's not enough to simply claim <laughs> that we believe. We must live a life of belief. You may have seen this verse of the day, Ephesians 2.8. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. And that's where everybody likes to just rest. That's enough for me. Cool. I'm good, right? Kind of, yeah, but keep reading. So if we see the rest, and it's not even the rest, but just one more line or verse after, for we are God's workmanship masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Oh, we don't like that. They don't usually put that up as the verse of the day. You see, if we truly have gratitude for the grace we have been given, then we will go and show appreciation for it. We'll share the gift with others. At least write them a thank you card or something, right? Have you ever given someone a gift and then not gotten any response at all? Like, maybe you put a lot of thought into this gift, a lot of time and energy, and they're just like, meh. They put it aside. How did it make you feel? Now, I know, we're not supposed to be giving gifts like that, right? We're just supposed to give it to someone because we love them, walk away. It doesn't matter how they respond, but we're human. Well, in Ephesians, here we see that God expects a response. You see the gift? And then what? We're created anew in Christ Jesus so we can do his will. There's a reasoning there. So yes, we get a gift, but it doesn't say anywhere in here, then do nothing about it. It says the exact opposite. If we keep reading, if you take a gift from someone, you keep it in the box. You put it on the shelf in the closet. Question. Have you really received it if you've done nothing with it? This is a sobering question that many who identify as Christians should really be asking themselves. Have I received it? Really? You see, in order to really receive it, you need to 
believe it. Very important. Sounds simple. But think about what we've read today, what we've looked at today. You see, the evidence of this comes from our response to it. Now, technically, someone may have received it, but we're not getting a response. So I want to take a look at one extra thing as we close. A new question needs to be asked. Has the person accepted it? You see, acceptance is an action, defined. Acceptance is the action of consenting to receive or undertaking something offered. There are many who haven't accepted this gift because they're like the Shunammite woman. Don't deceive me. Don't get my hopes up. Very much like her. Maybe she didn't feel that she deserved it. And so there are some here or watching online that don't believe they deserve this gift. There are some that can't believe that God would love you that much. Now, while it's not great to use John 3.16 as a standalone all the time. It's a very good verse because it's very true. He loves all of you that much. And in order to receive that, to truly accept that, you have to see your own value and understand that's true. You're worthy and you're worth it. And here's the thing important. You may be thinking that you've done something so wrong that you're not worth it. Here's the thing. Let me correct that thinking for you. There's someone that perhaps you've judged. There's someone out there who you think, even though you think you've done something wrong and you're in this perpetual state of beating yourself up over it again and again and again. But there's a thought inside your head. You're looking at someone else who you think, wow, that person has done something way worse than me. Or maybe they murdered someone. I don't know. And you're thinking, that person's way worse than me. But guess what? There are many people out there living on the other side of that sin, living a life of joy because they've received and accepted this gift. And you can too. Remember that. And you can't say you're not worth it because God made that decision for you already. You can't say you're not worthy because Jesus made that decision on the cross for you. Now, if you haven't accepted and received that gift... We don't do program church here. We don't do the big emotional altar call. Some of you are crying and stuff and, you know, get you all emotionally drummed up and you come make a decision. Nope. We want to do life with you. This is about a relationship. As it is with Jesus, it is in the church with all of us. And so we want to connect with you. I told you, we do the buddy system. That's the way Jesus and his disciples did it. I guess it worked for them. So we do it that way too. And so... In the announcements, you're going to be told some ways that you can connect with us. If you're a bit of an introvert or something, you can do so through the app, text, email. Let us know. We'll schedule a meeting with you. Or you're old school, you can write it down, put it in the box. Or if you're really old school, you can actually come up to one of us and start a conversation. <laughs> we will have an opportunity to do that as well. We break bread like they did in the early church upstairs in our really cool cafe. If you haven't been there, we're going to start having espresso, I hear. We got this giant Cadillac of an espresso machine. It's really cool. Anyway, we get excited about coffee, not as much as my wife. <laughs> but anyway, we want to do life with you. We want to break bread with you. We want to have a cup of coffee with you. I want to spend time with you, invest time with you. That's what real church is all about. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, and by church, I mean your body. 
these members of your body, each one holy, righteous, and redeemed, valuable in each individual way, but all coming up together to make up your church, that is the body of Christ. So I thank you for each and every one of these individuals, those watching online. Let them know how much you love them. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.